panel discussion. So uh, we've always had fun. We only tend to do one panel per TAD Summit. Sometimes we don't even bother with a panel. It, there needs to be <laughs> something that's compelling, that's an open question uh, that the industry is uh, facing. And we are seeing a lot of uh, hype around, oh, yeah, SaaS, it's dead. LLMs are going to replace. Um, so that that's the sort of overall topic. And as always, the reason TAD Summit has been successful over the years is simply we don't bring marketing people in, okay? Uh, we're bringing people who live or die by the reality of what they're delivering to their customers. It's as simple as that, okay? Because let's, you know, I, I always point, Ericsson and Nokia, it doesn't matter what they say. Telcos are going to spend billions with both of them. Uh, so as a result, you know, there's no live or die. Well, for everyone around here, whether your business succeeds or not, is what you know, what you're doing is delivering value to those customers. Full stop. All right. So that's why what you have to say it matters intensely. Now, uh, unfortunately, it looks like Nickel, um, he lost his voice yesterday. We were hoping he might have got it back, but clearly he hasn't. So uh, it's just going to be the uh, five of us here. So, what so we're not going to have a replacement LLM AI of him uh, joining to uh, give answers on his behalf. <laughs> okay. that is, uh, we're, we're not there yet. So We're not there yet. Exactly. And it would need pretty, well, it's either been listening to him for a long time or he has extensive published work. So uh, not to worry. So what I'd suggest is before we get down to the questions, uh, just quickly, just introduce yourself, your background, you know, what your company is doing in this space. Because I'm going to be dipping these up into separate uh, sessions that people will be dipping into. So even though you might have introduced yourself before, introduce yourself uh, fresh for uh, this piece, okay? So we will begin with Mr. Paul Sweeney, if you would introduce yourself, please. Hey folks, I'm Paul Sweeney. I am the uh, co-founder and chief strategy officer at Webio. We're a conversational AI company specializing in the area of credit and collections. And we use a whole bunch of LLMs, models, agents, and stuff to make that happen. Cool. Excellent. Uh, Carol? Uh, hi, everybody. So I'm Carol Bourgois. I'm the founder of Foxist. We are a speech AI company focusing on making extracting knowledge from speech, and we are based in France. Excellent. Lyle? I'm Lyle Pratt, uh, CEO of Vita. Uh, we're, uh, we make AI phone agents uh, for business. We also have a reseller platform been building uh, telecom startups for a long time and I'm um, having a lot of fun building this one. Excellent. Thank you, Lyle. And then RJ. Alan, thank you. My name's RJ Burnham. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Consig AI, where we are building AI associates and virtual team members. I had a long experience in voice and AI. They had multiple, built, built many generations of this along the way. So excited to get into it again. So Excellent. Again, thank you so much. So I introduced the sort of broad topic, which is, is SaaS dead? LLM is going to replace SaaS. We've seen uh, from the uh, Bay Area bullshit machine uh, quite a lot of uh, claims. So let's you know, get focused. Um, I mean, the shift seems to be predicated on sort of agentic architectures. That's the phrase. Um, I guess what is a agentic architecture and what are the factors that impact its development? And please just ju jump in and it's okay to basically when somebody's given an answer and you think it's wrong to jump in as well. But this is hopefully going to be an interactive discussion. Okay, guys. All right, who's right. going first? <laughs> Everybody's got to have strong opinions on this one. So. Well, why don't, why don't you jump off? <laughs> Go for it. Well, sure. okay. So, so I'm going to start with my first opinion. SaaS is, you know, SaaS is just going to evolve to encompass AI and LLMs. That, that's kind of the, the SaaS is dead, and LLMs replace it. It's just 
uh, random yeah. buzzwords <laughs> strung together in, in hyperbolic uh, fashion. Uh, I, I can come up with lots of those. Uh, yes, I'm going to be selling largely, you know, I'm going to use LLMs in my SaaS products. Yeah. I think everybody is. It's not just going to be large language models that come into this. There's going to be other types of models and deep learning models that feed into this. Our whole world, you know, everybody points at AI and thinks it's LLMs only. Well, no, that's just one small piece of it. And we are just scratching the surface of what we're going to see. Now, agentistic architectures, wow, that's such a lovely mouthful of stuff. Now, ignore the, like I said, I, 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 I get annoyed by some of the buzzwords and purses of it. I do think that's going to have a very large impact in business. I don't think it kills SaaS. I think that's just ridiculous. But I do believe it is going to have a large impact in how solutions are deployed. You know, we are looking at how those agents or associates go through, how they assist and help in people. And yeah. that may be where they work alongside them. It may be places sometimes where they replace with them. It's not going to be a, there's no one answer. And the answer of today is going to be drastically different than the answer of five years from now. Yeah. But that concept of an agent, the concept of something that can go in, take tasks, think, and that's, you know, that's yeah. really, frankly, a, you know, an overuse of it. But follow rule, that is going to be something that we see that that's, is that any different from, if you will, IVR and automated systems of the last 40 years? Well, it's the evolution of that. And yeah. we will be seeing a lot of rapid evolution in this space. Cool. That's good. Yeah. And, I, you know, when, when you, I hear uh, this is going to be the end of that. <laughs> um, most of the time it, it's wrong. It just remind me of things I, coming from the telco where I remember the time they say, oh, voice is dead. Now everybody's texting. And uh, so text is going to replace voice. And then five years later, they're like, oh, Carol, now uh, text is dead. Everybody is doing voice again because, you know, we, we moved to Alexa, et cetera. And, and then if you look at the, the, the what's truly happened on the field is, you know, both we're working even more than before. You, you maybe traditional voice in the sense of like uh, circuit voice, let's say, uh, went a little down, or at least the yeah. growth wasn't there anymore. Yeah. But that was replaced by a lot of voice over IP here and there. Yeah. Uh, text and um, uh, WhatsApp like uh, yeah, IP. Instant, mes yeah. Yeah. instant messaging was up. And you know, you you can't believe it because you like there is only 24 hours in a day, but humans are communicating even more than before. Yes. Uh, they are just using so many small uh, medium. I think yeah. for developer is going to be the same. The you know, developer used to work uh, on hard coded monolithic system and they did microservice, but there is still monolithic system being built because one is useful in certain cases, the other one is useful in other cases. They started so I using feel, API. I, I feel very strongly here that ultimately these channels of voice, text, video, whatever these modalities are, as the technology is caught up to make them more enabled, people are going to use what's most appropriate and convenient at a time. Voice is amazing for times when your hands are busy. And it's not just about synchronous voice. We all think about synchronous voice because we think about a live phone call. But if you go to Latin America, the world runs on asynchronous voice messaging. Yep. My wife is Brazilian. She is sending voice messages all the time, and it is an asynchronous mode of communication. But you can do it while you're talking, you know, doing other things with your hands. Yeah. Text is awesome for when I need to get a message off to somebody while I'm in a meeting and I'm still going through this and I'm sitting here solving something on here because that's a more appropriate. A lot, I'm a reader, I'm Gen X, I'm still one of the last gen portion of that. I love the text as a channel. And that's where a lot of people, I think, jump to it of why voice is dead. Well, we all, that whole generation jumped to it. Well, guess what? We have this other thing, which is the video generation. And we're all too old. We're all grumpy old men sitting on here. But my kids don't text, they don't do voice, they do a lot of video. And I don't think we actually fully understand how that's actually going to fully fit into this, but it is coming. It doesn't yeah, kill I've voice, it doesn't kill text. to understand the younger generation, and I, I, I have to confess. Well, I, 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 actually, I think our next generation of models that we don't quite realize that is right now, all of our video feeds, if, if you're on social media, your stream of videos is actually generated by 
AI and yep. the algorithm. Your stream and my stream are completely different and it is highly tailored to what you want to see. I actually believe we before long are actually going to have frame level generation where actually the videos themselves are optimized for the audience on an individual basis. Now, I think that may start with the summaries, which is the what 10 second, you know, what six seconds of the clip do you show in the preview mm -hmm. to begin with? Because that's, you know, you think about it, when you try you know, all, the, whether it's YouTube, uh, whether it's face, you know, and that, Instagram, I, I say Facebook, that just dates me right, right there on that, TikTok. All of these, ultimately, they show you little snippets of the video to get you interested. Well, that set of snippet is going to get customized very, very soon to be what Alan sees is going to be very different than what RJ sees. Ooh, that's and interesting. I, yeah. At what point do we actually move to, is that human-generated video or AI-generated content as we're going through it? I, so, yeah, I think fun things future, to think about. Because you know, with my son, uh, 14, he's always surprised when he's looking over my shoulder and it's like, oh, you watch that YouTube short series as well. Because <laughs> it, it, it's interesting, you know, again, you know, he, he has tons of jazz stuff. I mean, he's got his interests, but, you know, they're always throwing random stuff in. And if you pause to watch it, then all of a sudden you get more of it. So, uh, you know, the video mm -hmm. consumption, I think, I don't know. It, it, it's just hacking into, oh, it's new. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, what's this about? Oh, okay, I'll carry on watching. Oh, oh, that's boring. And you kick it out. It just wastes hours of time. I'm not sure about the efficacy of using it other than entertainment. But uh, you know, for the well, hackers, let's just just remember all of our all of our parents thought we were wasting our time playing on online. That we were wasting our time do, with this web stuff, playing video games, watching TV. <laughs> this <laughs> argument from the old people will never end, and it's yeah. just going to be the new forms of this as we go. So and I remember you know, making my first VoIP call, uh, and uh, I was in uh, in Los Angeles at UCLA, and I, I found this guy in China. And we could connect using VoIP. I could not connect to my roommate, which was the next room. And, and you know, I don't speak Chinese, and he didn't speak English. So we just called each other because it worked uh, through some VoIP channels. And so we spent hours, you know, losing time, not talking because we didn't understand each other, but just because we were fascinated by the technology. Um, so yeah, who had the little quick cam eyeball? Remember the little uh, round eyeball video cameras of the early days of video conferencing? See you, see me. The early days yeah. that was so innovative. It didn't matter what you. It was horrible, but it was just the idea you could do video conference with a random person was like crazy cool. Um, oh yeah, maybe I could jump in there, um, Alan. Just uh, yeah, go for a couple it. of points. Um, just uh, I was just reflecting on uh, the two ends of the scale that you yeah. could look at here. And so what, what just looking at simple things um, like dates, like saying someone, I'll meet you next Tuesday. Can I meet you Tuesday week? Uh, this is the day, different ways of saying it. And you know, that's a really simple, very new, very simple little case. But we found that just being able to take that and slightly ambiguous um, format and being able to use a, uh, an NLU or an intent engine to pick that out and and keep that process moving forward has been like a big unlock, right? For a lot of people, it's it's I'm able to now get your date, get your number, get your account number, get your other thing, and I can run a process and I could actually auto onboard you, right? If if I if I have that date, I'm able to get over those little ambiguities, and it just it it kind of reminded me of. They're very good for for taking away various degrees of like ambiguity from different types of data, and it kind of becomes this way to jump into a, a, a the more formal process. Like you're dealing with that edge bit that's a bit yeah. fuzzy, yeah, and you're able to put that into your you know your, your regular workflow. process, right? And I thought, God, that's a really neat little thing, but you kind of might underestimate the impact it has for companies just to be able to do that. And then, so that's like a, an agent can do that. Like a little highly trained, small agent is able to pick these things out very kind of confidently now at this stage. And I just got thinking about the, the bigger um, blocks of agentic, right? So yeah. if you're looking at like one of the most common features across everything right now is um, 
is summaries. Everyone wants to do a summary, right? And then you look at are summaries any good and are summaries, you know, blah, 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 right? But but let's look at it for a second. What's a summary for? Like you treat it like every summary is the same. It's not at all. Not and at it's all. not at all, right? So what's a summary? What's its job to be done? Like, what do you want from that summary? And then how do you want that to be assembled? How do you want that to be prioritized? What can absolutely not be left out of the summary? And what might be able to... Now, you can't throw a conversation over to OpenAI, get back a summary, and be confident that everything you need in that summary is in there and in there in the format that the agent needs to see the first, second, and third thing in that structure mm -hmm. to bring them into the conversation quickly, right? Well, Paul, a human doesn't do that any better than that. If I, if I ask uh, my, uh, you know, an assistant to go, you know, a, a human assistant to summarize this conversation yeah. without them knowing who the audience is of the summary, they're going to do a terrible job of this. Mm -hmm. And I, I, this is actually gets into a, one of my pieces is in many ways, as we're looking at the use of AI, we're actually often holding it to a higher ground than we do other humans. If you, know, if you think about a person coming into a job to try and do a job, you have to give them instructions. They can't yeah. just pick up and they're going to just know exactly this unless they're already an expert in that field and already have that context. Yeah. We're doing the exact same thing with AI components. And your summary is a perfect example of this where they need to know who it is for. My summary that I want to put in my HubSpot notes is completely different than this summary. You know, my internal facing summary is one portion of it, what's interesting. My external, I want to send an email summary, completely different. The auto-generated summary that comes out of my augers, which is uh, joins through it, is almost usually rubbish. I almost always have to regenerate another one because it doesn't have the right audience. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the power of the full conversation, the full transcript is important. But don't underestimate the summaries, but don't overuse, you know, don't yeah. assume that they're but, going to be useful. I, I think There's no one fix for everything. One point that I, I think that Paul kind of touches the, the, the bias of anthropomorphies, where we think about AI like it is a, some kind of human. So like if I, as a human person, I, what I would do is I would do a summary. So I want the AI to do a summary. But why? You know, in, in, in some cases, indeed, maybe the output should be a JSON file because it's going to be consumed by an, uh, uh, another IT system or by either another AI. And, and when you look at promptings, now you have system that create the prompts for you because you as a human are not going to write the better prompt. And it's the same way the summary is not going to be, if you want that summary to be used by another LLM to do something within a prompt, it might not be the way you, you as a human will do. So there, there is this anthropomorphic, uh, I think, issue that, where we that, often that, think about the AI like a human and it's not human. That's a, a brilliant point. And, and the thing about that, just to build on what you're saying there, when you've done a summary or you're, you're, you've, you've run, like you call up that agent, that agent runs the summary and it gives you back a response. Giving you back that response is just one thing it's done with the summary. It may also say, hey, this is a really interesting change in context uh, of when we did the last summary. Like there's been a state change in the conversation yeah. and therefore a change in context. And now you're saying, oh, this is interesting. I'm now going to trigger something else because... Uh, for instance, in our world, a customer might have said two or three things in a row that lead you now to believe this. the context and the summary of this conversation is, in summary, this person is now financially vulnerable. They're saying, I'm going to have a lot of problems paying this bill. I've got a lot of other things to juggle at the moment. I've also got a kid in hospital. And you go, wow, this is a number of different things. What what do I call up next to do, right? Do I run a financial review? Maybe not appropriate if they have someone in a hospital. So I really got to look at, in this case, I always, if there's ever a, a healthcare vulnerability, it goes to the top of the action chain of what I'm going to do next. And so it can, it can get quite quite complicated in the detail of how they're orchestrated, right? How, you, how the agents are calling up the next thing. Yeah. And that's where you need kind of, we believe at the moment, very fine control over everything that happens with the agents. Um, uh, so, so Paul, you actually hit on a very, you, you hit on a very key point, and this is where I, I feel the current systems still have some very major gaping holes. We've moved towards 
prompts as being the way we program and express what needs to happen. And I don't, th- I think that's a very LLM specific way of putting it together. Yeah. Uh, I think in many ways it's as flawed as my you know, diagram, you know, my menu diagram uh, visualization around it. The, you know, my hypothesis is what actually in, you know, the, what actually is the right way to express these things is what I call fuzzy rules. Mm. You have a, a hierarchy of rules. As humans, we have, I'll say, you know, level zero rules that are driven, you know, drive most of how we work in, in as humans. Well, you know, do not harm other people. Do not yeah. kill other people. These are those like ingrained rules that most of us don't ever break or we under when we do break, you know, well, I'll say, even though when we break them, we, you know, there's a large impact on it. And I, the way I've sort of thought about this is you model as weighted rules. Some rules are unbreakable. They're the foundational pieces that we go through it. Then there's many rules that are high suggestions. Do I use mm-hmm. profanity in, in the workspace? Well, it depends some cases, it's entirely appropriate, and I can break that rule. In other cases, absolutely not. Yeah. And I ultimately think a lot of these AI systems are ulti- going to be happy. We're going to have to find a way to represent this hierarchy of rules of things that are really, really important. And by the way, they're going to conflict. That's yeah. mm, you, sure. it, You're going to have conflicting rules. And at some point, the algorithm has to say, well, I'm going to break, I'm going to break rules. It's impossible not to break rules. And you, in fact, you want a system to break rules. Well, what does it at the least cost? And I, you know, the, the model I've kind of gone with is that the, the rules have weights and how, if I'm an agent, if I'm an AI agent, how do I accomplish this task with breaking the least expensive set of rules to get to the result? And Interesting. I, like I said, I don't know yet. I haven't yet found an interface and a way to go through it. Prompts aren't it. Menu trees are not a call flow chart, but that I think we're going to end up with a some sort of hierarchy of rule based way we program this, which is it goes back to the rule based. Yeah, we, we've had rule based systems in the past, but they're very strict and they're not easy to work with. Yeah, because they're it's binary. You it's either you follow you follow it exactly yeah. or not, and there's yeah. not a weighting of like how important is this rule on a scale of one to a hundred. Um, so but, Lyle, just jumping to Lyle because yeah. he's hiding okay. there. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe I'll circle back to the, yeah. the topic of the uh, the conversation. Well, you know, will LLMs kill SaaS? Um, I think it will do exactly the opposite. Um, you know, what fundamentally AI and LLMs do is they drive the cost of intelligence to zero. So, yeah. you know, the cost of intelligence is ultimately going to zero. And that's going to have profound impacts on, you know, what uh, what it takes to build a SaaS product. Um, you know, we've probably heard, you know, the, the sort of trope that, OK, you know, LLMs and AI isn't going to kill Hollywood. It's just going to make everyone a director. Um, you know, the same is the same is true with uh, with, with SaaS and startups. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've probably written, you know, millions of lines of code in various languages over the years, but that gives me nothing now. You know, um, anyone can speak English and output, you know, any language that they want. Now, do you have to have, you know, at least now some fundamental understanding of what you're trying to build and what you're trying to do? Uh, sure. But, you know, uh, fun- fundamentally, it's uh, it's 100x easier today than it was, you know, two years ago. And, um, you know, if you're running a team of software developers, if their productivity hasn't doubled or tripled or quadrupled over the last couple of years, you know, you're doing you're doing something wrong. Um, You know, no one on my team has written any tedious code in, you know, a year. Like, why? Why should you? Um, You know, you have this machine that will that will output, you know, whatever you want. Um, And I think it's going to drive a lot of evolution in existing software products, you know, as well. Um, you know, like if you look at at our product, we have this thing where an agent can upsert or or add information to contacts. So every time you know it takes a call with somebody, if it hears their name or if it hears their you know their interests or what problem they had, 
then it adds the details to to a contact entry, and that contact entry can be synced to the company's CRM. You know whether that's HubSpot or Salesforce or whatever. Well, you know, before somebody had to do that manually, and you know now it's a you know it's saving companies thousands of hours a year, and that's just one little tiny thing. Uh, so yeah. you know the big SaaS companies are going to get a little bigger, but the competition is going to come in a big, giant, massive wave. Yeah, no, excellent point there, uh, Lyle. I, I'm just going to keep focused on you because um, on the second question around vertical LLMs as being a sweet spot given the sort of limited you know availability of enterprise data, you know everything else just gets eaten up by one of the big companies in this space like OpenAI. Do you think that's correct? That you know most of the you know smaller companies in this space are just doing a vertical focus uh, because the reduced data set and the sort of more general, uh, you know, uh, LLMs are going to be with open AI, et cetera, or do you see it as more <laughs> complex? I mean, uh, you know, it's it's hard to predict at this point. I mean, we need to remember, you know, ChatGPT 3.5 is only two years old, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. two years ago, GPT 3.5 came out. You know, versus what we have today, it's essentially useless. Um, you know, they don't they don't even offer it in their UI yes. anymore. Uh, so, you know, I, I think uh, RJ said this at the end of the, the the last panel. I mean, you know, the what you're using today is not going to be what you're using a year from now, much yeah. less six months from now. Yeah. So, spending a lot of time and resources to, for example, fine tune you know, a specific model for a specific use case is essentially a waste right now. Uh, I would highly uh, recommend you not do that if you're in this space. Um, and, you know, we have a lot to, uh, to a lot of thanks due to Mark Zuckerberg, uh, honestly, uh, from driving a lot of the open source uh, LLM innovation yeah. uh, over the past six months. Uh, so exactly. I have a lot of hopes. Who, that, who would have um, thought we'd be uh, looking at uh, Zuckerberg as a savior? Yeah, yeah honestly, uh, you know, he started he started rolling jujitsu, he started surfing, and now he's open sourcing all the LLMs. You know, it's a pretty, <laughs> pretty good pivot. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, I, I think competition is only going to increase. Yeah. Um, you know, the state of the art is only going to get better. Uh, you know, sure, is that state of the art going to be driven with, by companies with with tons and tons of resources? Absolutely. Uh, but a lot of that's going to get open sourced. And, um, you know, and that's where the, the innovation happens, uh, in, in my opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because uh, Rob Pickering was making a point uh, with the latest uh, you know, speech to speech. He says, yes, but it's expensive and there's open source there. So we've mm -hmm. got that protection that enables, with your you know, large or small, there's routes to take advantage of those capabilities. Sure. The issue is exactly, though, every time someone says it's expensive, it's going to go down so fast. That was my first, yeah, the, when people first showed us the OpenAI LLM, <laughs> so, oh, that's way too expensive. You're never going to use that. Yeah, that doesn't, <laughs> that reality vanishes so quickly. Yeah. So, yeah. We've actually I think one of the issues I, I see with things like um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, Sorry, Carol. No, I, I just wanted to 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 rebond on, on you know you were talking about speech to speech, by example. Yeah. And uh, um, we, we RG was talking, I think, about the standardization later on uh, earlier. And uh, you know, if you look at speech to speech, the the biggest issue you have is that you are kind of you have a locking in terms of technology because that means that you can't change a part of the system at this time. Yes. Um, and I, you know, I, I was talking with a large insurance company uh, who end up because they were large and uh, they they needed somebody serious, and uh, so they did all the RFP in the proper way. So they work with Microsoft, mm -hmm. um, and then after two years. Um, they call me and say, you know, we have an issue because it's like we we now realize that there is at least fifty percent of the calls that will never work because we need to put some, uh, you know, like Paul was talking about, like some specific agent that are yeah. very good at understanding debts, by example. Yeah. Uh, but imagine you you want to understand insurance claim numbers, uh, and if you if you have a generic model uh, that was made for by Microsoft for worldwide uh, use. 
it's not going to be the best one understanding your specific way of doing claims uh, numbering, by example. So you would like to change just that piece of the system. And if you have speech to speech, well, it, it, it's mean that, you know, it's, it's hidden behind all of that. Yeah, you can't keep the, the best ASR for this language. And also that's the, that's the other thing, like, you know, you, you hear those models that are very good in 100 language. Well, you know, they are not very good in 100 language. They do 100 language. And out of that, you have five of them that they actually do at a commercial level. It's yeah, something you can use commercially. For, for all the other language, you probably have a better solution somewhere else. Uh, you know, if you look at very specific, uh, you know, Arabic uh, in Egypt, uh, you know, yeah. it's not going to be a generic model that's going to be the best for that. So the issue I see with some of those integration that like speech to speech, is it's both like super appealing, uh, but I don't believe at the end that's going to work. We, we need things that are more modular. And I think at some point it will be thanks to maybe some form of a standardization where you can at least have some APIs, uh-huh. you know, old fashioned APIs where you, you can talk to the model so, and say, hey, for this part, I want to use that type of model. Then here is the way I do it. Yeah. You know, something like that. So I, 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 as much as I lo- love standardization, there is something I think, I think the challenge we are going to have is in this case, big tech does want to lock you in. Let's be clear, they want control and you they want you not to go buy from multiple vendors. If I'm Microsoft, I want you to use all the Microsoft pieces. And this is actually probably one of the reasons why I've said, you know, have not wanted to get into the peer platform business because this, we are in a very different situation than it was in the past. And I think that we, as small companies, we have to think about this very carefully about what is our value prop and how are we going to do battle against these Goliaths? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the prior universe, I'll say, of my being David and fighting against telecom bits is was fighting against, okay, stupid dinosaurs, because a lot of telecom is stupid dinosaurs. The challenge I think we do have is, in this case, the big old Goliaths they're not stupid dinosaurs. They're freaking velociraptors. Yeah. And I, I hate to say it, like I said, fighting against Microsoft, Amazon, Google, OpenAI, these guys, it's going to take a different kind of fight. And we're going to have to think about how we go after it because the world, you know, in the past, you know, it was you know, when I started Voxeo, yes, I'm fighting against Nortel. Do I get, am I have any fear of Nortel, you know, coming against this or Nokia coming mm-hmm. against me? God, no. By the time they even figure out what I'm trying to do, it'll, there'll be t- three years of inefficiency. Well, these guys can move fast. They are showing that they're willing to adapt and they're making big changes. Now, I do think what we're going to, I think from a platform business, the challenge we're going to have is they do want to own the whole spend. They do want closed systems. And where people do get footholds, I think they're going to be very acquisitive and buy it up quickly and to make sure that they control as much of this as possible. They do have an enormous amount of capital and they can throw that around when they want to if someone becomes threatening. This creates some great opportunities where if you can go and poke the bear uh, and really injure the bear, there's some great chances to get bought by the bear uh but on the other hand it might just also mean being killed by the bear because <laughs> uh, they you can need to kill, ultimately... you need to kill the bear buddy you need to kill yeah, the bear I, i've always said if you're going to shoot a, if you're going to shoot the bear you better be ready to shoot to kill you well, don't go in there you halfway. It, it says this new crazy orange guy in charge in two weeks zuckerberg finished microsoft big problems <laughs> Antitrust, okay. yo, you have, I'm just saying, oh, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, don't, don't kid yourself guys. So look, being the dumbest, dumbest dinosaur on this call and definitely the least coolest guy, except your note taker, Otter, uh, I'm a little depressed because I mean, uh, what a bunch of brilliant guys here. And my favorite Frenchman besides Pepe Le Pew Carell is on here. Uh, I'm just blown away by the level of intellect here, but I, I think you guys still have the stealthness. I think you guys are still in a good position and I think just from looking at a business perspective and following antitrust, and I won the last failure to deal antitrust in the USA, you're going to have to start looking at things differently. And instead of fighting with sticks and being afraid, 
you, you got to try to start, you know, putting uh, Mickey's in the drinks and trying to screw these guys other ways because, you know, they're still behemoths. They are smart. They have a lot of smart people, but don't kid yourselves. You got it. It's still about the level of it. I mean, I'm just looking at the names here. I mean, you got Carell, you got Lyle, you got Paul Sweeney, you got RJ. I mean, you guys are off the charts. And of course, you know, the King Allen Quayle. Uh, but, but I'm saying you guys are off the charts. So I, I don't like that negativeness, Rajay. I, I see. I appreciate your concern, but I think you guys well, got to start. So, looking so at don't it. take that as negativeness. What I'm saying is you have to fight a different fight. Exactly. You can't Absolutely. Treat, it's not the same universe that was before. So find the ways that you can get a different set of impact and change the industry your own way. They are going to be very defensive. They're going to try and block things. So figure out where those spots are that you can provide unique value that's going to disrupt and make a big impact because there are exactly. lots of them out there on this. I like, so I it, don't so, take that piece around that as like, Oh no, it's doom and gloom. These guys are going to, no, they're not. So, yeah, but it's, you can't follow the same world of like, it's, it's not the same universe of going in and fight against, I'll say the telco behemoths. Exactly. Like yeah. Years it's ago. a different It game. is not the same exactly. fight. I'm interested in your view on that game, Lyle. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I would generally agree, you know, it's uh, building products, building startups is about building things that people use and, and you know, things that, that people need. Um, I think the biggest challenge in, in building what we're building, AI phone agents, I mean, a lot of us are sort of at least tangentially in, in that business. You know, it's about it's about providing UIs that people understand, you know, wrapping up functionality in ways that people can configure themselves you know, bundling up the contact syncing and the and, and the contact upserting, you know, in a, in a way that that Joe the plumber, you know, can plug into his service now subscription. Um, yeah. well, ultimately, those are the things that people are going to buy. They're not buying, you know, a simple LLM interface. They're yeah. not buying chat GPT speech to speech. Um, all of those things are just tools, you know, behind the curtain that the customer doesn't care about at all. Um, exactly. I mean, in my opinion, like if you're if you're a developer only solution or a developer focused solution, I think you're going to run into to more problems uh, yeah. over the next couple of years than if you're Amen. actually building a product that people can sign up and use and configure and get value from yeah. immediately. You know, as we know, there are a ton of existing developer focused services out there. You know, Twilio has a launch partnership with OpenAI for speech to speech. Um, you know, as you guys were saying, speech to speech sort of um, it, it eliminates a lot of the complexity under the hood of making an AI phone agent, you know, do what it does. Right. You don't yeah. need this separate uh, speech to text engine, this separate text to speech engine and this separate system to to buffer the LLM output so they, that they come out quickly. You know, all that stuff sort of goes away. Right. Yeah. And it's only going to get simpler. It's not going to get more complex. It's going to get simpler. Um, and, you know, again, we're only two years into this LLM world. Um, you know, the, there's, there's, an, there's a few open source speech to speech uh, engines out there. DeepGram kind of, kind of has a speech to speech system. It's, it's not really speech to speech, but it kind of is. Um, yeah. You know, an open AI system is brand new. I will say there's tons of problems uh, with OpenAI's uh, system. You know, we've been heavily testing it uh, over the past few weeks. Um, you know, one thing is that the cost isn't anywhere close to what they they said it was. Uh, I yeah. think they said it was six cents in and twenty four cents out. Cents, that's it. Yep. Our real world testing is more like fifty cents. Uh, you know, to fifty to eighty cents uh, in and out. And OpenAI has actually acknowledged that problem. Uh, it's and they're, and they're trying to resolve it, but. Point being, this is the early days, yeah. um, and we as founders, uh, you know, as people building startups, we have to solve real problems and you know step yeah. back and make sure we're providing real value and not waiting. Exactly. So you, the way you defend is the focusing on the end customer with the UI and features, the channel to market that reaches them in a way that just it's a turn of a key and it's all working, and packaging. So it's just again easy to use for a business owner to set up. 
You know, they're not going to have a, a you know a geek. They're not going to have an IT person to hand this off to. It needs to be as dumb as simple as possible. Yeah, I, I think one of the beauties of you know this AI revolution is that a lot of the technology that was only uh, you know only possible for big companies with you know that could spend uh, half a million dollars on their conversational AI, AI platform for their call center, right? Yeah. Um, this stuff is available to anyone now, and and I think that's where the the opportunity is is breaking down these barriers, making it more available to businesses of any size. It's no longer a seven-digit uh, problem, and yeah. that was the universe we've lived in. It's you know it was breaking into six. I think it's a five. I think it's a four, and I think it's going to you know once you cross below that, now it's just a cost of sale and an onboarding piece that allows you to bring almost a frictionless onboard. I, I, that to me is the exciting spit of it makes such a bigger. There's so many more people that can afford that level of an investment. Than you can that need six and seven digits up front to build yeah. something. No, I agree, but I have to say that, uh, and it's it's it might be wrong, <laughs> uh, but I I still want to believe that we can have other actors than the big OpenAI and Microsoft and AWS also for the the lower uh, engine part, because I, I don't want to be depending on only them. And so I think, you know, if, if we were saying earlier, there are a lot of things coming out in the open source uh, domain. You you have the, the cost of computing that's going lower. So I, I hope that some startups, um, and uh, hopefully mine <laughs> among them, we, we can also, uh, you know, go to, at the lower level and, and compete on, on the on the technology. I, uh, so I, I do have I have tools. some strong opinions, and, and I agree it's, it's super hard, and it's 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 not a low hanging fruit. Uh, and I, I probably lie, you, you're you're totally right that the the opportunities right now is much more about uh, you know customer uh, servicing customer uh, with uh, uh, system that are user centric, let's say. But um, at the same time, I don't want to, personally, I don't want to let it go on the model spot. Well, you're in France. Yeah, I don't special think... case. <laughs> I I, wish... I, the, prob the problem I see on that is the cost to build these models in data and compute. Unfortunately, the bar has shifted so far to build a competitive general purpose model. Now, within specific use cases within specific niches within specific domains it's a very different case now that being said there are going to be some small folks that surprise us with innovation and ideas that come out of nowhere that change things fundamentally but it is still a data game and it is still mm. a compute game on the training side to do this and yeah, so Alan on this point it's maybe right being in France might be a little different because in France and in Europe globally we, we are seeing uh, quite a lot of funding from governments and European Commission to help uh, startups you do, uh, there, there, access. There are political domain, you know, there's political impact around here about control that is going to shift some of this and I, you know your, your France oh, yeah. is a perfect is a great example. I do think there is going to be major pressure in certain markets that want, if you will, protection from the major control. I mean, I, 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 looking at this through the computer vision space, for a long time, computer vision, the best space rec was all coming out of China. And as the you know, as a US and EU, there became a, wait, we can't buy from China for this. And I think we will see some similar domains that rebalance portions of that it is going to take major investment you know you are going to have to be you know there's going to be, in order to get to the top of that there is going to be opportunities for going into and being the like I said politically non-secretor or the independent place that's safe because guess what you know china is one domain u.s is one domain uh, I mean, for years, Russia was at the top of this AI research, but nobody wants to touch that now with a 10 yeah. foot pole. Uh, there will be political shifts that happen through this. And that does make opportunities for 
well-funded startups to make huge impacts and gather some very good pieces of it. I do think on the foundation but, but model, I think there is, you need funding. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, going back to what Johnny was saying earlier, there is also a, a real question for me of... Uh, um, uh, uh, oh, how do you call that? Uh, the um, conglomerate, not conglomerate. Uh, oh, conglomerate? No, conglomerate. Um, we call them monopoly. Monopoly. Thank oh, you. Monopoly. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Some sometimes my my word in English doesn't don't come so so easily. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, there is a real question of monopolies, and we are talking about. I mean, right now with the current political situation in the U.S., I think nobody wants to touch a any type of monopolies yeah. but still you, you've heard uh, i think was some uh, uh, people on the republican side that were talking about they want to dis uh, disbundle uh, google because they think google is too much well, Go google google's uh, finished let me tell you something if the election goes the way the polls are going google's got a major problem because uh, and i'll tell you the biggest thing i saw a brilliant piece on elon musk and why he's doing what he's doing. And it's really about controlling the conversation of AI. He's not happy with open AI. He's not happy with Microsoft. Doesn't like Bill Gates. Can't stand Zuckerberg. Wants to fight him. There, there, is, the, there is potentially a devastating landscape change because the new president will just let him do whatever he wants. And if they let him loose, those guys better run because the... the but like U.S. broke up AT&T. You guys are all probably a lot younger to remember. I, I go back to divestiture when AT&T, when the government came in and said, OK, AT&T, you're finished. You, we're going to open up everything to everybody. And it, it was an amazing opportunity, you know, and yeah, rampant with fraud and, and what have you and the, the, the world comms. And the, but they were just it was just to open up. So. I think things are going to change. I mean, we'll see. I mean, just if you look at the polls, if not, it's the it's, it's same old, same old, same old. Nothing will happen. But Elon Musk, I saw a brilliant piece on that. The reason why he's there, I heard, and it made a lot of sense, and I wish I had the, the, the interview that I saw, um, is to control the conversation on AI uh, when it comes to uh, not only censorship and, I mean, everything else. In the USA right now, they're doing this whole – the blocking stuff that we have are coming on. So th things are changing. And I think you guys are, uh, I think you guys are in a great position. I I'd love to see the bunch of you guys get together and really get a think tank and go steal some money from some VC somewhere, really create some really cool stuff. Um, not steal, not uh, steal. Oh, oh uh, no, you. No, Alan, no. I, I've got, I've got three points I'd like to go for it. Mick, if we have time, please. Just, yeah, absolutely. Just, to bring, just to bring it back to agentic, right. Yeah. Uh, which please, is why yeah. some of you looking here. Um, uh, just the, just three things. So the first is like uh, how rational um, the software gets, like how logical is it able to, and where yeah. does that happen and how does that get done? Yeah. It, it, if that's done within some fix of tree of thought, tree of graphs, whatever they use, yeah. if that gets solved in the agents that's that or in the uh, LLM, that that's a big disruption, but it's yeah. one to keep the eye on. Yeah. Um, the second is, I think, orchestration is generally handled outside of the LLMs now. Yeah. So we point the LLM at the orchestration. We run the orchestration. Yeah. If the LLM gets good at agentic orchestration itself, it has that capability. That's another pressure to the top and the, the big guys continue to win if that happens. Yeah. Um, and the third thing is to note is this uh, ubiquitous observation um, of our desktop being an agent itself in that it's being looked at by like anthropic you will give it permission yeah. to look at everything on your computer to fulfill rpa type requests through your data on your computer that's that's launched like this week from anthropic right and yes. microsoft are definitely trying to make that happen in a more encrypted way but again it's just observe observing what you have on your computer it's going to also observe what's happening on your screen in real time so whatever you're looking at, it will observe and be able to tell you things about what you're doing. So it's this idea that we, we briefly touched on it earlier about we have text, we have voice, but we have vision. Yeah. Probably the biggest disruptive vector is going to be vision and the data that comes from being able to see what's happening in your work or around your work or in your environment and that yeah. then being open to agentic processes. Yeah. So in in terms of 
like how big a disruption is this? I, I, my pragmatic self is with everybody in the room here, like working with it and doing things and delivering products, right? That, yep. That's where my practical self is. My, my more dreamy kind of disruptor self is kind of going, wait on a minute. Um, this feels an awful like, like, and bear with me, global crossing. And you might say, what? Well, if you go back to pre-2000, Global Crossing spent more money than God on fiber optic cables globally, right? Yeah. It wired the world. It, yeah. it was an amazing infrastructure build, un un unprecedented. And then it went bust. With that fiber it laid, built the foundation for the next 10, 15 years Absolutely. of in internet access, right? So what I'd like just my provocation is, hey, if there's this huge AI factory being built, and frankly, it, it it's a bust, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't deliver what its promise was for everybody today. And like, we're going to automate everything and everything's going to be awesome, right? And our little Lego men running around. Let's just say that doesn't happen. Yeah. My provocation is what infrastructure is left that we can use that brings us to the next 15 years of intelligence as opposed to connectivity. Like that that's that would be my provocation to everybody in the room. It's like, because uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not I convinced. I love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, open, There's a lot open, of GPU. Open AI, uh, open AI I, I, is, a, is a bust. Open AI is going to expect it to lose $44 billion by 2029 due to its arrangements with Microsoft. So the, the guy from Open AI doesn't even realize he's already walked into a death trap. And I was around with Global Crossing. And John Ledger is a guy that came in and cleaned up Global Crossing uh, out back and voice in those days. And now then he will see what he did at T-Mobile. So it's going to come down to the leadership. But I, I'm glad you brought that up. But OpenAI is a bust out. It's a complete bust out. Lyle, do you have a view? I mean, I, I guess I would just reiterate that, you know, <laughs> we're two years in. <laughs> and, um, you know, we have incredible... Open source. None of us knew who OpenAI um, was two years ago. Nobody, nobody knew. Uh, you know, if open, if OpenAI goes bust, the show is going to go on. Microsoft exactly. not going to let them do that, though. Uh, yeah. They'll take control <laughs> before that happens. Exactly. Uh, but well, you know, that, um, that's it, what I mean. We're, we're they're, still, they're already set up to be taken out. They basically are already controlled by Microsoft. But yep. the point being. We're still in the first inning. Uh, I do totally agree with what Paul was saying that, you know, um, the next unlock will come yeah. as these agents are actually able to do more things in the software that businesses already use. Yes. I mean, for us, you know, one of the biggest, you know, hurdles to onboarding a large customer is how do we get the agent, you know, integrated into the software that the company uses? And uh, these new tools, uh, you know, having an agent browse the web and do things on the web, having the agent control legacy software that doesn't have an API, uh, all of those things, you know, are going to improve, um, you know, by orders of magnitude over the next couple of years. And I think we're all going to look up in, you know, <laughs> a few years and, and look back at this time and be like, holy crap, you know, that was only two <laughs> years ago. You know, when, when this I, was I also would, I would say don't underestimate Apple in all of this. They have an immense place to play and they keep their mouth shut until they're ready to make an impact on it. And then they screw it. It definitely has an ups. You know. Will they upend it? I don't think that, you know, they've never upended the enterprise as well as they can, but I think they are going to make a very big change. And it's going to be one of those that once they play their cards, it's going to be one of the, it is going to be an interesting plot twist. That yeah. ships a lot of it. So I think one one thing that Light said that I found very interesting. You, you are talking about how you can use um, AI to interface with legacy software without going through the API. But I actually think it's 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 going to work also for the APIs uh, enabled software. I mean, today when you, I, I look, I, I have some. Um, I've been doing some work in the healthcare industry, and they have a lot of softwares. All those software are super complex APIs, etc. But at the end of the day, what I need to do is I need to answer a couple of fields and to fill those fields. I'm probably much going to be much more efficient to build a model that know what are the fields that I want to answer, 
And I don't give a damn about what the API is. And I, suddenly I'm compatible with 99% of the software out there, whether they have an API or not. And, and that, that's going to be super powerful because a lot of those software, they have locking where, you, you know, the API you need to, to uh, pay uh, uh, some money to have blocking you so they, they control who they work with. Um, and so I think there are also going to be some interesting opportunities there. Cool. Excellent. You were breaking up a little bit, but I think the meaning was clear. You came through in a quick rush at the end. So, uh, but just to Paul's point, I think adding in the logic with LMs is going to happen and it's going to be powerful. I think the orchestration is, because these are stuff we, you know, paste around the sort of core engine. It will be absorbed on the um, desktop agent. Hey, we'll see what happens, you know? But I think that the LLMs will add a lot of the functionality that we're having to paste around them today. But we should finish uh, on the core question is, are LLMs uh, you know, going to basically uh, kill SAS? And I think the resounding answer is absolutely not. Is that correct? Yeah. Unless. <laughs> I, kill SAS, no. Disrupt SAS, yes. Yes. Yeah. That, I that's... think it changes, the, it changes the game and it becomes great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, it's just another piece of software that you basically just integrate into your SAS product. 